Hello once again, I'm chemist John Morris Pendleton. Who is John Pendleton? He's an American missionary in Mexico, he has a bachelor's degree in chemistry, and he's an advocator of a six 24-hour day creation. He also believes UFOs come from Satan. He will attend a debate if all expenses are paid, and he states a love offering is optional, whatever that is. And we're now in our fifth conference, and this is one of the really exciting ones because I know it's a question that lots of people have. What is the age of the Earth? 4.5 billion years. When did the creation actually occur? 4.5 billion years ago. And of course, we're going to go to the Bible. Let's not use the lead lead isochron dating or the various independently verified radiometric datings. Let's instead use the scientific book that states pi is equal to 3 and that the sun revolves around the Earth. Now, by comparison, looking at two timelines, one of what the Bible says, one of what uh, evolutionists say. Evolutionists do not say anything about the age of the Earth. Evolutionists talk about the change in allelic frequency in populations caused by natural selection and genetic drift. You know, evolution. However, rational people say the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. And evolutionists are a pretty rational lot, so we'll forgive the error, but only because you're wearing a lab coat. We have the creation of everything happened about 6,000 years ago. About 4,400 years ago, the worldwide flood occurred, of which eight people were saved. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary 2,000 years ago, and we expect that maybe in the next five minutes that he could come back again to rule the earth. Yeah, we wish. Then we wouldn't have to watch the rest of this drivel. Are you ready? He could come back. He is coming back, and it could be soon. Now, according to the Big Bang Theory, in evolution, it was about 20 billion years ago. It was 13.7 billion years ago. There was a big bang, a big explosion. It was a rapid expansion of space-time. Millions and millions of years went by. 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth was formed. Let's get this straight. Life started on Earth somewhere between 4.4 billion years ago, after liquid water formed, and 2.7 billion years ago, the date of the earliest evidence of life. From where they don't know it collected water began raining on the earth and three billion years ago the first life forms appeared which survived, had something to eat, and were interested and able to reproduce themselves into all the forms we have today. Geez, when you put it that way. Actually, your straw man argument still sounds more convincing than God did it in a day. Now, where do we get the idea from the Bible that the creation of everything happened 6,000 years ago? In the Bible, beginning with chapter 5 of Genesis, we have genealogies. Caution. Incoming Hoven chart. And we start with Adam, and it gives the age of the father when a key son was born in the line that eventually reached to Jesus Christ. And so we begin adding up these ages, and we come up that the flood occurred 1,656 years after the creation. After the flood, we continue to count genealogies. We have the age of the father when their son was born. Then we have time of captivity in Egypt, then coming out, wandering in the wilderness. Uh, the different years for judges and kings ruling over Israel. Other ages of captivities. And we come all the way down to the final book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, where from history we had between three to 400 years Sure, what's a few hundred years between friends? To when Christ was born. That's a total of about 4,000 years. From Christ to today is 2,000. 4 plus 2 is 6,000 years. Well, that sounds pretty scientific. Oh, wait, that's just the lab code again. Now, let me give you a little suggestion. When God reveals a truth in his word, he reveals it many, many times from different angles in different ways to confirm the truth of it. Except where those angles differ, like they do in the conflicting genealogies of Joseph, as recounted in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And so in the case of when the creation occurred, we also have from the book of Luke, an uh, angle that goes back the other direction. And as mentioned, it is different than Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Because in Luke 3, we have the genealogy through Joseph all the way back of from Jesus until... <clears throat> Adam. Of course, Joseph was Jesus' political father, but still we have the genealogy in that direction. It turns out to be 75 generations. 
Now, I propose that we take an average of about 50 years for every generation between father and when this son was born. Sure, make up whatever numbers you want to fit your theory. That's how creation science works. Now, I realize that sometimes it was more time than that, sometimes it was less time than that. But we just want to get an idea. So if we take 75 generations, multiplied by 50 years for each generation, we get 3,750 years, very close to our total of some 4,000 years from the creation until Christ was born. Why settle for a 6.25% margin of error? You can just make up better numbers. Psst. 53.3 years per generation will get it dead on. And so it confirms that attitude. Let's summarize. Using conflicting accounts of the genealogy and guesstimates of ages, you arrive at your preconceived idea. Wow. Just wow. Now from the evolutionary standpoint, their clock is called the geological time scale. Now as you look at this list, don't say, my, what unusual names. Are they more unusual than the names from your chart? You know, you know, I'm not going to even read these. At least you know this one at 190 million years, which is the Jurassic period. All of you know about Jurassic Park. Actually, there's three periods here I want to mention for later reference. It's the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous rocks or uh, periods. Now, the idea is this. These numbers here represent millions of years in the evolutionary time scale. And the idea is that the oldest rocks are furthest in the earth. On top of them are younger rocks. On top of them are younger rocks. And so goes the sequence. That's simplistic at best. The principle of superposition, that of older rocks on bottom, is only one of the many principles of stratigraphy. Superposition fails in many cases, including dynamic activity, like cross-cutting of one strata into another as plates shift, failure of supporting strata, like cave deposits from a collapse, or inclusion of strata into newer strata, like cross-cutting followed by erosion. In the cases of mountains, faults and folds make the situation considerably more complex. Superposition is one of many null hypotheses that are tested against evidence. It is not unshakable word. Now, we asked the evolutionist, where can we go in the world to see exactly, in sight, these layers of rocks exactly as you've laid out there? You can find evidence for the basic truth of the principle of superposition almost anywhere. For instance, the Grand Canyon has one of the most complete in situ geologic columns in the entire world. We're thinking, where could we go? Oh, I know. We could go to the Grand Canyon in Arizona. That hole is almost a mile deep. In places, it is over a mile deep. We have all kinds of layers of rock. Guess what? About 50% of them are missing. Well, guess what? The missing layers were caused by a period of erosion about 1 billion years long between the two major periods of deposition, one 500 million years ago and the other 1.5 billion years ago. Note the principle of superposition isn't even violated here. It's just interrupted by erosion. Also, as you can see in this next transparency, from Canada into the United States, all this red area is called Precambian rock. This is rock that's even older than 600,000, 600 million years. And the younger rock is underneath it. In other words, the whole thing is turned upside down. He's ignoring geologic erosion and uplift. Remember, the superposition principle is the null hypothesis to be tested against evidence and possibly rejected. This is what happens when they send a chemist to play geologist. Actually, there's only one place in the world that you can go to consistently find, consistently see these layers of rock is laid out. You know where it's at? In the books. I told you, they're good at making fascinating drawings of things that don't exist. That is not science. As mentioned, the principle of superposition is demonstrated almost anywhere you look, including the Grand Canyon. The basic idea is illustrated in books for the hopeful edification of others. The principle is also presented as a null hypothesis, subject to modification or rejection based on evidence. That is science.